Are you doing the intro? Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Fife Property Show this Saturday. How are you, Jim? Absolutely fantastic, ready to go. This is the best, this is one of the best subjects ever. Tune in if you're a thrifty landlord and you're wanting to slash your upfront costs when you buy a rental property, because this is the masterclass on how to do it. Really good tips here, really good information here as well. Uh, and this will give you, if you're just starting out, this is for you. If you're an experienced investor, guess what? This is for you as well. Uh, Richard, back to you. This is going to be a great show. Yeah, definitely. Um, how to slash your upfront costs when you're buying a rental property is such an important thing. I think being thrifty is so important, especially in the current climate. We've covered it in several shows over the last few weeks and months, Jim, about how to save and how to be more uh, a logical process about what you're spending and, and yeah. how to, obviously, if you watch the Wealth Creation Show, you'll, you'll be familiar with that. But yeah, despite um, the changes in tax policies and buy to let, uh, remains a hugely popular life goal for many people um, as one of the safest long-term investment strategies. So property feels real. It's got tangible, it's tangible assets, it's visible, it's stable assets. Um, things that like shares and your favourite gym, crypto uh, and foreign exchange simply I'll can't lie. Uh, it came up my feed yesterday on my phone, somebody about, oh, we've, do, we've got £2 million pounds with footballers and uh, movie stars and all the rest at two million pounds in crypto investment for these people and i looked at crypto and i went wait a minute crypto is crypto is back to the price it was in 2018 yeah it's like wait a minute since 2018 my property has gone up 35 <laughs> percent <laughs> and i've been paid yeah. while it went up it's like who the hell wants crypto in comparison obviously property is, is far outperforming uh, things like crypto and i think it is it is as well if people are investing their money their savings if they're in releasing equity property it is like a, like i say it's that tangible asset you can see it it's yeah, visible yeah. you've got it and it's and it's creating cash flow and things as well uh, but nonetheless the upfront costs for buying an investment property are some of the biggest barriers um yeah. landlords face and buy, buy to let finance requires a higher deposit um than a standard obviously residential mortgage yeah, and yeah. the second home or stamp duty or land and buildings tax supplements add another large sum onto that. And a lot of people forget about that because you've got... They're joined, <laughs> up, thinking, they're joined up thinking in the revenue. And and I, and I finally found that out. There is joined up thinking because I got a letter, I got an email yesterday from my solicitors uh, and they said to me, Jim, mind that property you actually sold to your limited company uh, back in September 2021. Well, they're wanting the ADS on it, the additional dwelling supplement. And I went... Now, I knew at the time that they failed, they forgot to put the ADS on it of 4%. Yeah. And I thought, I'm just going to wait to see what happens to see if anybody's actually checking this at the revenue services. Uh, and, and and lo and behold, they are. So how they've found it out is because, because um, I thought, how on earth would they find it out? If the solicitor's not said it's a second home and they've not ticked the box for it's a second home, how would they find that out at the revenue mm -hmm. services? And it was like, it was because it was a limited company. So every right. limited company because limited companies are legal entities in their own right they're yeah. not people so they're not privy to the the uh, exemption from the ads for your principal by residence which is your own home yeah um so so it's automatic for every single limited company so when you start a limited company for the first time you will be paying ads on your first property regardless it's not like you as a personal person buying a house for yourself mm -hmm. um and we're going to talk about how to do that actually in your own names <laughs> and how to, how to get around that don't tell anybody, especially the <laughs> revenue services. <laughs> yeah, that's an interesting one, Jim. So I take it, obviously. Hey, you... hey, let me just explain here in case there's anybody on here that's going, I'm going to report. I'm... It's like, no, it's legal. It is a yeah, legal oh, process. Yeah. We are not breaking the law here. We're just telling you the ways in order to take advantage of the preferential system that exists just now as it is. It's up to them to close that loophole if that's what they're wanting to do, yeah. but... But they can't really because what we're going to talk about is stuff that you really can't you can't legislate for. If, if, and it'll all become clear. So if you're an investor or a seasoned investor or a starting out investor, or you just want to know more about buy to let investment and educate yourself more. Remember, it took me four years almost to make that first decision to buy a property. Four years from learning. Mm -hmm. It was a big, big hurdle for me mentally because I didn't understand what I needed to do. And I was so afraid that things would go wrong because no one else was doing this. And I was yeah. like, 
come on, this can't be this easy. <laughs> it was. It was that simple. And and that's what that's that's my barrier. That's the thing that held me back because I genuinely thought it couldn't have been that easy. It's like the way our creation shows when we give all that free information out. Folk are about to think, and I did one yesterday What's about the seven, here? <laughs> I did I, I did one yesterday about seven actionable steps to become wealthy. I watched that. I was like, people are actually watching this and they'll be thinking to themselves, oh God, it's not that easy. It bloody well is. <laughs> yeah. Just apply the knowledge. This is just going to do it. And in 10, 15, 20 years' time, you'll be minted. Yeah, I was just going to refer uh, back to your video for yesterday. It was quite good. I, I had to watch it in the afternoon. Um, so, yeah, if you haven't caught that, you'll get that on Jim's page. It's really good. So And it's, it's all stuff that you can do. Sorry to steal your thunder. No, no, you're right. You're fine. All stuff that you can do um, day to day. Yeah, that's that's how it's so simple. And people think this has got to be difficult. You know, you've got to go through some sort of pain and torment and stress in order to achieve these things. It's the old adage about, you know, a diamond isn't formed. A diamond is formed from carbon, which is put under extreme, extreme pressure, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So, you know, in order to be victorious, you must have some sort of pressure or you must go through some sort of struggle. Well, possibly not on this occasion. And you don't need to take part in that adage. Um, you just, you know, it's easy enough to do. You just have to learn and you just have to understand and do it. That's it. Discipline yourself to do it. That's the hardest bit. The hardest bit is you're in charge of your own financial future. Right? And that is the hardest bit. But it's also the best bit. The best bit is you're in charge of your own financial future. The hardest bit is, and the worst bit is, you're in charge of your own financial future. Depending on how you look at it, glass half full, glass half empty. That sort of thing. As long as you, like, if you, if you keep yourself up to, like your your knowledge, keep building your knowledge on what you're doing, and and know how to do it properly, or know how to speak to the right people who know how to do that, you should be fine. Um, and that's where, that, yeah, and that's where people I think the hurdles start to give them that fear. Um, but anyway, so the big question is, can you reduce your upfront buying costs for starting or even expanding um, your lettings portfolio? Unfortunately, the answer is yes. Yeah, uh, and we're going to look at it today uh, and have a talk about it this morning throughout the show. So, first topic: For God's um, sake, don't get married. <laughs> well, That's yet, <laughs> yet, yet, yet. Yeah, yeah. I say yet. Don't get married yet, and we'll explain why, Richard. Why? Well, uh, did you know that if you're married and you're registered um, or even in a civil partnership, you're penalised over? Uh, couples who haven't yet tied the knot now so if your plans are to include obviously getting married um as well as becoming a landlord you could be doing yourself out of thousands of pounds uh you're better off buying your rental homes first before your actual wedding day or your Why is that? well Why is that? married couples are regist or registered civil partnerships yeah. or whatever count as one person for stamp duty or stamp land duty and tax. yes absolutely because you're one person I mean, yeah. that in itself isn't really right, if that makes sense. I mean, we own have we, uh, There used to be a case, Richard, uh, you'll not remember this because I think it was before you were born. Um, mm -hmm. There was a case where uh, your uh, your personal allowances only went with one person, the man, in a relationship right. when you got married. And you had a married man's allowance that went alongside that. So individual, a woman didn't have her own personal allowance um in that case so mm -hmm. this we both got our personal allowances now and we both get equal equal opportunities for that and even people in the same relationship and join together like a couple so yeah. why should that not apply to buying a house if it's an in individual names but apparently this doesn't because of this piece of legislation that actually penalizes you for it so yeah. you're actually getting penalized for being married now so we were actually wanting people to get married, and now it's like, well, we're advising buy your houses first under yeah, your names, we'll off and eventually you your investments or whatever it is before you get married, because this is why this is how you can do it. So even mm -hmm. if one, even if only one of you owns a home, when your spouse buys the property, even as a even as a first time buyer, you'll be liable liable for the second home supplement, three yeah. percent in England, four percent in Scotland, of the entire purchase price. And it's because you're classified as a couple. But if you've got, if your spouse, well, your partner, and you're no civil partnership and you're no married, if you're if you're living together, just make sure nobody really knows that, if that makes sense. <laughs> I'm yeah. not aware of that. Because you could nail you on the, on the what was it? Um, I think it's after four, if you've lived with somebody for four right, years. Then, I can't remember. Maybe that's, a, maybe that's a wife's tale, an urban myth. 
Um, I don't think so. Well, I, I was always under that impression that if you've been together, lived, lived in the same house for four years, then you're classed as basically a third. Well, does it really? I'd be interested to hear if anybody out there knows Yeah, that, that would be quite good if somebody could jump in and comment so we could find out. If, if, if you, I can't remember what it was called. It's, uh, uh, no, it'll come back to me. So if you live together apart for so three or four years and you're permanently together, then you're demonstrated under as uh, a common law spouse or something like yeah. that? It's a common, a, common, a common law partnership or something. So know. common law, which is which could go against you when you think about it, if somebody actually said that. So yeah. you know the reality is, uh, if you're going to buy to buy to let, uh, wait till get wait till you get married a civil partnership before you actually. Um, I'm just going to assume get married. This civil yeah. partnership and get married is like flipping it. It's just getting married. Eh? Um, so wait till you get married. Wait before buy your houses or your yeah. first house in your own name. If you, it's going to be in your own name. Remember, if you're buying a limited company, you're nailed for it anyway. But if you're under the maximum, if you're under the uh, threshold for um, tax and you're in the basic rate threshold, or you're maybe not even in the basic rate, you've just got your personal allowance because you're maybe a stay-at-home spouse or a stay-at-home yeah. person, um, or you maybe got a wee part-time job and it supplements your income, having an investment property. Um, that, and, and that's the reality. A lot of people out there don't realise that that's what buy to let does. It actually mm -hmm. just is a supplement to people's incomes. If yeah. not... We don't have the huge, you know, landlords or hundreds of properties. You know, these people are few and far between. Um, yeah. It's very, very rare to have that. I mean, out the whole landlord population, the two million landlords, I think it was, um, I remember reading it was like only about 10,000 have 30 or more properties. And now that's not a lot. It's not uh, a lot. At that time, but that was many years ago. It might be a bit more now, but it might it actually still be the same right I mean, now. There might be a wee bit more landlords, but probably the percentage... Uh, it'll probably be roughly about the same. Yeah, so we I mean, just get to hear about them, that's all, because yeah. they're, they're more prominent. And obviously they want to sell on their courses and stuff like that because they're bigger yeah. landlords. I'm going to make more money out of this. I'm going to diversify my incomes. I'm going to have multiple income streams. It's like, I hate that phrase. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, and, and you know why I hate a phrase? Because it's like a double glazing salesman. Yeah. That's what it reminds me, the double glazing salesman a mentality, sales the yeah. multiple streams of income. It's like, you know, it's like it's you didn't need multiple. You just need to stick to your zone, be really good at what you've got, be world class at what you've got, and you'll make a fortune out of profit investment. That's the reality. It's like you yeah. don't need to have the multiple bit. It's not necessary, and it's never been necessary. I had my job, and I had my, my buy to let, and that's all I ever had. You know, maybe I might want to diversify my income now in order to make sure that I'm de-risked from certain areas areas in case anything changes but it's not the end of the world you know i've got a pension but that's a good tax deduction for me um when we go into higher rate you pay towards your pension therefore you get the higher rate tax back on your pension contribution and plus the fact you get the pension contribution you get the tax added onto that and your pension as well so there's an advantage to have that pension alongside if you're a higher rate payer and you have property investments and that and then also there's an advantage as well to have a limited company when you've a higher rate payer because then you could put it into the limited company and you could leave it there and it's only taxable at the company's rate it's not taxable at your higher rate unless you take dividends yeah but then that could be mitigated as well by putting a contribution to your company pension uh your your pension your or your personal pension not your company pension uh your, your personal, personal pension yeah that could be mitigated as well. And um, so there's lots and lots of advantages there. Uh, so hold off getting hitched until you're after it. Oh God, I'm going to get, we're going to get stuck for this, aren't we? <laughs> like we'll, have, we'll have these people that were desperate to get married now saying, oh, we maybe shouldn't get, and one of them's going, maybe shouldn't get another one's going, where did you hear this? <laughs> <laughs> now, um, for, the, for the interest of, of, um, of uh, uh, equality, uh, where did you get this? You know, I'm just doing the two yeah. different points there. <laughs> um, so just to just to just to show that at that time, um, it's it's nothing to do with this, the sexes or anything like that. It's the fact that you can, you, you basically you know holding off to you get hitched. Now, I'll the be honest. I got married, Richard. I've told this story before, but when I was an accountant and I was training at college, I realised that you got something like, we just talked about the married man's allowance. Yeah. And it was £500 extra a year in your hand. And I immediately ran home to Elaine and says, we need to get married. <laughs> and she went, what? <laughs> and this was like, this was like um, maybe February or something like that. And says, we need to get married before the end of the tax year. Because <laughs> then we'll get the married man's allowance before, and yeah. then we'll get, that'll be it. So we'll get an extra 500 quid. 500 quid in the late 80s, early 90s was a yeah. lot of money. 
Mm-hmm. So, um, so, so, nineteen ninety one. I think we got married. Yeah, definitely we got married. Just, just for the record. <laughs> just so. Oh, I'm not sure. What do you mean you're not sure? Um, yes, we got married in nineteen ninety one. Um, so nineteen ninety one is when we got married. Five hundred pound extra in your hand was a lot of money. And when yeah. I found out about the married man's allowance, I thought, well, let's get married. And within two weeks, we were married. <laughs> and it was about one hundred and twenty people at the reception, and and everybody was like, what's going? What's on? And and at that time, it was like. Are you pregnant? Because <laughs> that was a thing at that time, man. Eh? It's like, yeah. oh, what? You're not married and you're pregnant. It's like that was the old days, um, and 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 that's that's the story. Eh? It was it's hilarious when you look back on it. But <laughs> but hey, five hundred quid up, and it's five hundred quid of compounded investments over the years. Say, yeah. So that five hundred quid is probably worth a lot of money today in investments, which I've which I've made because of that money. Thank you very much, yeah. Mister Taxman. Thank you very much, Fife College for accountancy. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's good. Um, but like you say, obviously that extra five hundred. But you've obviously put that to brilliant use and invested that. Absolutely. And, yeah. So, um, so yeah, definitely an advantage. But like, yeah, like you say, hold off getting hitched um, because the money that you could save on stamp duty, or obviously uh, land and buildings tax and things, second home purchases, you could use that towards your your wedding, your honeymoon, or you could yeah. use it for future investment. Um, but if if one of you don't earn enough uh, yeah. to get a mortgage on their own, uh, look into obviously maybe joint borrowing, uh, sole proprietor mortgages and things. These allow you to pull your joint incomes um, for greater buyer, buying power with only one of you listed as the registered owner. Yeah, um, yeah thereby avoiding the stamp duty. Uh, yeah. And so well, that's quite a good point and one to obviously, like a lot of people don't know that. Um, a lot of people forget about the stamp duty altogether. Uh, mm-hmm. your second home tax so um please keep yeah. that in mind yeah. when you are purchasing your buy to let but we're not telling everybody to cancel their weddings but uh, <laughs> ah, <it's laughs> the use of it realize and understand the, the tax implications about yeah. you can't be benefit i mean effectively saving on the eds because you've you know you've just waited to you bought your first house before you got married it's like that that investment property that eds would pay for your wedding yeah quids in so you you got your wedding for free on the government. Woohoo! No. I know, <laughs> and it's like you say, Jim, it's, it's not ways of cheating the system. It's being smart and knowing how to uh, use the system to your advantage. Yeah, um, absolutely. So, um, take yeah. advantage of these these uh, these uh, things that are open to you right now. I, I think the next one for me is find a fixer-upper. Um, yeah. So what do we mean by that? Well, despite all the makeover TV shows, most buyers don't want to live in a building site particularly families and busy professionals. Yeah. Um, this often makes the market for under-modernised property slightly less frantic than for homes that are ready to actually move in. Uh, so fixer-uppers cost less, yeah. um, which means lower stamp duty, ADS, LLTB, and whatever. We'll just call yeah. it stamp duty to hell with. Stamp, stamp duty is the L- LBTT, Land and Buildings Land Transaction Land. Tax in Scotland. It's stamp duty still in England, but we'll just call it stamp duty. Everybody knows what it was. And ADS is the extra. It goes on top for second homes. Yeah. Um, they also give you the chance with for potential extra equity if combined purchase and refurbishment costs are less than the value of the property that are renovated. This is actually quite a good one. Uh, a lot of people are actually, what they do is they bridge for the six months. Yeah. So they buy a really undervalued property. They get it for an even better price. They bridge it for the six months. They get there, they fix it all up, and then at the six-month period, then they release the bridge, they put it on a buy-to-let mortgage, but they get the higher rate in terms of the valuation. So often, the valuation could potentially be a lot more than the actual amount it cost you in the beginning to buy and bridge. And therefore, it's effectively a no-money-in deal. And that's what we yeah. call an infinite return. What do you get in the bank? 0.2%. Yeah. What do you get in buy-to-let if you do it right? Infinite return, infinity. My God, and what does that mean? That means you've got no money in this deal anymore. There's nothing in there. There's no money in this property anymore of your money. It's all financed through the bank's money, cleverly utilizing the extra gain you got in equity that you locked into that property when you renovated it to that good standard. 
and actually manage to pay back their innovation costs as well at the same time as releasing the equity. It can be done. We've done it several times, Richard. I've demonstrated that loads of times, and we will possibly talk about that in the website. I was just going to say, it's Monday on the itself. agenda to talk about on Monday's show. Yeah, so 12.30 uh, Monday, we're going to be talking about that as well, as well as talking about assets and liabilities yeah. and how assets, assets could be liabilities. Liabilities could be assets. Wait a minute, I'm an accountant. And assets are assets and liabilities are liabilities. No, so how can a, an asset be a liability and an, a, a liability be an asset? How is that possible in, in commercial reality? We're going to talk about that on Monday at 12.30. Yeah. So refurbishment costs are less than the value of the property, as we said, is removed. Um, yeah. Inefficient homes lose value as bills go through the roof. So pick up a bargain and make the energy improvements to increase your equity and achieve a higher rent. Energy efficiency is going to be a big thing in the future. I was just going it? to say, that's a good one to pick to pick on. Um, and a lot of people now who are buying, they're looking for something with a, a C rating yeah. um, and, and steering clear anything that's lower than that. I mean, the average property in, in the UK and Scotland is about a D. But obviously everybody's like, because the, the, the minimum band is coming in at C, everybody's looking yeah. for a C. But you might find... You'll you'll get property with a lower EPC rating that might be a wee bit cheaper, obviously, to per, to pick up. And fairly sim uh, simple uh, improvements will bring it up to that C level. So I mean, I mean, you might you might need to know what to look for and think, right? Okay, if I improve this or if I change this, fairly and uh, inexpensively, I could bring it yeah, up to a yeah, C, yeah. and you might be able to pick it up at a, a lower price point. But then um, you would really need to know what you're looking for as well. Here's the next one. <laughs> Make sure you have all the cash for the refurbishment costs. Yeah. Don't take the project on unless you've got all the money to finish the job. Now, why would you do that? Because then you're not left under pressure to actually cut back on things and you're able to maximize the full yeah. gains when you go to remortgage it and refinance the property. Now, I don't I shouldn't say remortgage really, because you're no you're only mortgaging it for the first time. Because yeah. you've either got the cash to buy it in the first place, like I do and then do up, then put a mortgage on it. Or you've got a friend or a joint venture that comes in with you and they provide the cash for you. You give them a wee bit of return, maybe 5% or something like that for that period of time. Uh, that avoids obviously the entry and exit cost for bridging. Um, yeah. And and that makes that work for you. Or what you can do as well, and, and I kind of say, I wouldn't say worst case scenario, but is the fallback position, is your ultimate fallback position is you go to the bridge route. Um, but, but you have to make sure the exit and entry costs for bridging are, are make sense and actually work out in that in that uh, in that overall project in that that workings and for the finance for it. Uh, you, know that, you, can um, save, you can also save on the labour costs, Richard. This is a really good one. Yeah. So you can save on the labour costs here often more than the materials itself by completing simple jobs yourself, like decorating, like upgrading door handles, or fitting blinds or curtain poles. Now, this is what I did in the very beginning. First yeah. thing I did when I, was, when I came home for work is in, in finance as a financial director and financial controller in industry, I just used to come home for work. I just used to get a quick bite to eat, get my overalls on. I used to go out the door and I used to put the carpets down. I used to do the decoration and the wallpapering. I used to fit the bathrooms. I used to fit the kitchens. I used to do the plumbing. I couldn't touch the heating, obviously, because it was gas registered. Um, but I was allowed to do the electrics because there was no standards at that time. But I did have what it was as, as long as you're a competent person, you were allowed to do the electrics. Now, I wasn't talking about the main fuse board and stuff like that. I'm talking about just light uh, switches, switching man. light switches, switching plugs, um, possibly just because they were cracked and they maybe, had, uh, they maybe had paint on them. It's like the one thing I can't be bored is scraping paint off. It's like the, the, a new socket's for like, what, pound fifty. And it's like, I'm going to sit there for like an hour trying to scrape paint off a, off a socket. And, and it's an hour of my time is worth a lot of money. And for the sake of just doing pound fifty to change it over to a new socket and save yourself about three quarters of an hour, it's like, why would you not just change it then, chuck away the old one? Um, you could also change it to USB uh, adapted as well. Yeah. New standard USB sockets as well at the same time as your normal socket. Um, so that's a huge advantage. So these are all things that you can add value and it compounds towards the end. That's the key here about compounding to the end to get the, the top value out of it. Right, finally, if you're a bit handy and have the time and inclination, you can find tutorials uh, on YouTuber, uh, on a YouTube for larger jobs like laying the floors, plastering. God, I had a go at plastering. I tell you what, I wasn't good at it. 
Um, I don't think it, I would no, that you, you kind of think when you go bosh, 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 bosh. Harry Enfield, loads of money, that sort of thing. You'll not remember Harry Enfield. I do remember Harry Enfield. Loads of money. Aye. Well, he, he implied it, bosh, 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 wallet. And it was like easy to do plaster. And then I went bosh, 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 splash. Uh, and I mean, you see, you, you see the professionals doing it, and it make, they make it look easy, but it's, it's no, not it's like, easy. Yeah. And it's like, that looks really easy. How have I got deeps and curves and grooves and all this? <laughs> What's going on here? How is the plaster sticking to my trowel? It's, uh, yeah, it's not that easy. Um, tiling was pretty straightforward once you understood the mechanics. I've done I, I my own bathroom tiling. Yep. Uh, basic plumbing for even uh, even more cost cutting, you know, uh, or, or cost saving. I wouldn't say yeah. cost cutting, because cost cutting implies you're, you're actually doing something to, to make it cheaper, uh, to cheapen it. But it's actually just cost saving. That's all you're doing out of that uh, situation. I think it's important to think like, when you're starting out and you're and you're obviously on your first couple of properties and things and maybe you're trying to obviously stay it to a, a, a really strict budget and things this is where you could really save money i think yeah. as you as you progress and have a bigger portfolio and do you know what i mean you've got your, your time's worth a lot more to doing other things yeah. then that's when you start bringing in contractors and, and things and then i think you always obviously need to use contractors obviously for the specialist things well um, that's what i say about the caution yeah. Employ an expert for works like wiring, yeah. installing a boiler, knocking down walls. I tell you what, I've seen some <laughs> horrific videos where people yeah. have knocked, hey, hey, knocking down the wall and the walk just passed and the next minute the whole wall falls and it misses them by a fraction. Yeah. And it's like we're talking about a wall that will kill you. And and these people are just knocking down walls like there's no tomorrow thinking it's okay. The next minute the ceiling comes tumbling in. If you know what these old flats are like with the horsehair ceilings and um, the plaster that's up there when that comes off and that hits you it's going to do some serious damage i'll tell you it is lethal um so often people will just what we do what are called the poke it um, and to get it come down before they actually put a normal um uh, um skim, they put a, aye, they put a normal um plaster uh, skim coat on it as well um so that's that's what they do beforehand just to make sure before they put that false seal in uh, and then they'll skim it from there, and it'll be a perfect seal. They right. they are very very. I would would I would, I would use the word dangerous. You know, my yeah. my father in law. I remember he did it. It was one four four Taylor Street. <laughs> Doing it with the, you know basically putting the paint on to paint the seal, and it must have been a wee bit loose, you know, underneath boss uh, to the yeah. to the actual Latin Latin plaster. Um, so it must have been loose to that. And, and he literally just walked away, and I saw the whole thing just come right down, crashing to the ground. And I thought, Jesus, that would have that would have hit his head. Mm -hmm. it's like that would have done some serious damage if that had hit him. So you know, I was I was I, I was very wary of it, very uh, you know aware of it after that for that very reason. So anything that needs a safety certificate as well or building regulations, get an expert in to do it. The DIY savings could cost you dearly if you're not doing it right. Yeah. Uh, later on, it could it could come back to haunt you, definitely. I mean, the worst case scenario it, for people, it's like I've I've seen, you know, I've heard and seen people, you know, I just did a wee bit with the gas and a wee bit this, and it was like, what? <laughs> what are you doing? Don't touch the gas. <laughs> what in heck? And the next minute, you'd get an engineer round. This is this is people in the past. I'd get an engineer round to pressure test the gas circuit, and it's got a leak where they were messing about with because they don't realise they've got to put PVA tape on it, then they've got to pressure test the gas system to make sure there's mm -hmm. no leaks. They don't have all these tools, and they think there's nothing wrong. It's like, I'll just get my lighter out and put it around the thing. <laughs> it's like, no, that's going to be the should, thing. Uh, shouldn't they laugh because it could, it could have really, like, catastrophic results? It does, yeah, it does, and I've seen people do it, and they still do it today. Not people that we have, but no. I know there's people out there that will still do this type of thing and think, oh, I know I'm competent and all the rest of it. That's all very well. But what happens if anything happens to your tenant with the worst case scenario, death, and it comes back to you, it's this happened, you're going to jail for manslaughter. Just say you're in jail. Yeah. So don't risk it for a few hundred pounds saving. It's yeah. not worth it. When it comes to gas, uh, use somebody that's gas safe registered. Electrics as well. I would never dream of touching electrics now um, yeah. for that very reason because um, because it is just what I said. It, even if, you know, the changing of the plug or the changing of the socket, stuff like that, you know, that's still, now that there's legislation in place to say this is what you've got to do and this is the standard you've got to keep, 
it's like if anything happens and, and a fire, here's another one. You know, I had an electrical fire years ago in one of my other properties uh -huh. where the fridge freezer actually was plugged into the wall and the fridge freezer went on fire. But luckily enough, I had had the safety test and done the fridge freezer. So the insurance company went, where's your safety stuff? I went, hey, here it is here. And they went, all right, okay, that's fine then. Uh, pay out. And basically they paid out 20,000, you yeah. know, to get everything refurbed, all the smoke damage. Everything got, um, this was just in the kitchen, by the way. The whole kitchen got replaced. Uh, the ceiling got double skimmed because it's to make it fire retardant because yeah. ceilings in kitchens should be double skimmed double coated with um, plasterboard so to make it fire return and resistant because that's where fires would start first really um and then also then the put the let the because it was smoke damage throughout the house they well, decorated the whole house uh, i managed to even get double glazing and i managed to get a new bathroom out of that as well <laughs> <laughs> That was a no bad one then. <laughs> that was a no brainer eh? <laughs> <That's> like, <laughs> You could say I was I was happy, <laughs> but obviously that's not the case. Uh, but I mean, the, the, you never the want that to happen because somebody could seriously be hurt. That's yeah, definitely of course. The case. And the important part in that is that you had the right certificates and things in place and the safety checks. Absolutely. Yeah. So I think um, to move on and think about what's next, I think forgetting about what's kind of in vogue at the at the moment at, at, at the time when you're buying. I mean, while there's no buyers... point in running out and buying a, a, a dark blue kitchen. Yeah. I know with gold handles. I mean, it's in vogue right now. People like rose it. Rose gold and rose but gold. The reality and blue is and, yeah. your, your kitchen will potentially last you maybe 15, 20 years um, if it's looked after well. Yeah. And that's not going to be in vogue in five years' time. Um, so, so sorry, Richard, just you. No, kind you're of, right. no, you're right. Because you know what I say to me, why have you not got a white kitchen and why have you not got a orange kitchen and why have you not got a rustic kitchen? And, and it's like, no, no, no. The 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 neutral one at that time was beach. So beach yeah. kitchens, magnolia, white skittings and facings and doors, and beige carpets. That was nice and neutral, ready yeah. template for somebody to put their own stamp on it, but it went with everybody's furniture for that reason. That's why I did it. Um, yeah. So, what was your I mean, for this? yeah, I mean, times have changed, and I think we tend to go with it's white and grey now, uh, as opposed yeah. to the the beechwood and the and the magnolia. But like you say, that will still take stand the test of time. Um, but yeah, while most buyers and things do chase um, like the Victoria, uh, Victorian yeah. and Edward, Edwardian and like the nineteen thirties kind of look, or, or or brand new homes even. Do you know what I mean? They either go for a period property or they look for brand new, um, and they look for maybe in the poshest streets or. Or the more upmarket streets, um, the smart and thrifty landlords uh, look at other options, uh, and the other options would be maybe to choose accommodation, of course, over architecture, and find homes from periods like maybe like the fifties and the eighties, and even up to the nineties, um, that maybe have a smaller fan base from people yeah, that are yeah. buying from a residential purpose, but they are they're brilliant buy to let properties, and and th these are predominantly what we see performing really well as investments. Um, Jim, you've got quite a lot in that, like the range across that kind of um, yeah era. I mean, obviously, well, the that's, that's quite interesting because we we did talk about this about location, location, location. Yeah, you know, and it isn't necessarily the thing in Lettons, Remember, um, the less expensive streets and neighbourhoods with lower yeah. purchase prices and often no stamp duty or LB or land and balance tax. Uh, you know, even you could maybe get away with the ADS if it's under forty grand yeah. by one pound. Uh, you can get away with that, even if it's over forty grand. But you can pay extra with the for the fittings. <laughs> See how I did that? Yeah. <laughs> so maybe forty two thousand. I'll tell you what, I'm going to pay two and a half thousand for the fittings included in that. Therefore, the house is actually thirty nine thousand five hundred. Therefore, you don't pay the four percent ADS. Yeah. Um, for that reason, and it's perfectly justifiable and perfectly mm -hmm. legal to do that. So they can often produce higher yields, and that's how I first started out. I was buying houses, or I was buying flats at like nine and fifteen thousand pound. Mm -hmm. um, and they were great properties. And what I was doing was I was adding that significant value to them by actually decorating, carpeting, painting, making sure the heating systems were up to standard, making sure the electrics were up to standard at that time, making sure everything was nice and tidy. There was no influx into running and change the kitchen and running and change the bathroom. Um, I've still got some of the bathrooms now. <laughs> but, but but they're fine. They're, fine. They're, they're perfect. They're fine. They're neutral. They're they're there for the job to do. And it doesn't it doesn't you know when somebody comes in and it becomes an objection after a while, it's yeah. like okay, then let let's look at changing this now. Um, but but there's nothing wrong with that. It's 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 to make sure you get higher yields and higher higher returns. 
And why I say higher yields and higher returns, because that is what's going to that's what's going to ride you out this sort of scenario we're coming up for now. Is when interest rates are beginning to go up, when inflation's beginning to go higher, when costs are beginning to accelerate, you're therefore going to have to pay more money to get jobs done on properties. Therefore, you've got the margin that you've accumulated over the years. You don't spend it on yourself. You just reinvest it or you yeah. keep it in the business to, for, for times like these. You can weather a so-called storm. Mm -hmm. um, that's why you're doing this. Um, even use the tips from the Pretty Vacant blog that we did. The, the link's in here in this article we've done. Um, so click on that, on on styling unfurnished homes to add designer elements to your plain interior. Um, what's your final thoughts on this then, Richard? I do think, like, the, the properties that I find that are quite successful by to lets um, and really good additions to an uh, investment portfolio is that 1950s to the 1980s kind of era, the ex-local yeah. authority yeah. property um, that's maybe not in the most popular postcode, Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you're picking it up at a good price point. Yeah, your 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 rental values. I mean, they're good, and you're making a brilliant return. These are what to look at, and these are not. I mean, obviously, I know the sales market's really busy and and uh, things at the moment. So uh, all properties kind of in demand at the moment. But typically, these are less popular than maybe the character property or the new builds and things that you're going to pay a premium for. Well, every oh, dog has yeah. a and I always believe that saying. So you know, it, it, in everything. And yes. especially property as well. At some point in time, your property will be up and coming if, mm -hmm. if it's not just now. Um, so you don't need to run and buy the most uh, aspirational area right now. You you might be able to foresee that. Um, classic example is look at Aber Hill next to the train station. Mm -hmm. So Aber Hill is going to be an up and coming area because it's right next to the train station and leaving now. It's getting built. So I suspect that might move up in value and might be a bit more. Well, it's already started. It's already yeah. started to move up in value, and that, yeah. I think that's only going to increase with the with the train station and things when it when it arrives in a couple of years' time. Or a few and years when time. I bought and I invested in that area, that's exactly what I thought of. I know it's thirty years ago, but it's weird that mm -hmm. that's actually now coming to fruition. That's that's coming back. But at that time, it was all talked about a train station going there eventually. And I thought, well, if it does come back, we're quid then. But the fact is, I'm in house right next door to leaving. It's like mm -hmm. you just walk over the Bobby Brig and you're at the swimming pool, you're at the retail park, you're at the high street, you're at the bus station, you're, you're at the beach. You're at everything. You're, you're on the beginning of the beach. And it's yeah. like, why on earth would that? Why would Aber Hill not be more advantageous to be in rather than in mainstream methyl or even mm -hmm. in Buckhaven? That's miles away from leaving. Yeah. It's like you can't walk from there to leaving, and yet from Aber Hill you can. It makes absolute sense to me logically. But for some reason, it had that stigma over the years that people go, oh, I don't want to live there and all the rest of it. It's like, you're, you're that's, head. That's I live there. That kind of stigma and, and uh, view of the area is kind of, I think it's starting to change as we move forward. Yeah. I mean, even for when I started doing property and things, the, well, the approach is changing. Shadow of a doubt. You know, people used to have the stigmatise and, and areas and all the rest of it. And then I thought, well, I'm just going to move into there. So we lived there for five years. Mm -hmm. And it's like, Nobody batted an island. And at that time, I was a company director. Everybody wondered what I was doing. It's like, what? You're a financial director. <laughs> what are you doing? You're, <laughs> you're moving in there. It's like, have you gone nuts? What people? And I actually had people question me who said, um, the people think there's something wrong. It's like because you're moving into that area from where you are right now. Think of your standing in the community. And I went, I couldn't give a shit about my standing. I'm only concerned <laughs> about my future. <laughs> and if this is going to set me free, I'm prepared to do this. Yeah. Um, and, and literally, that's that's exactly what I did. You know, um, I, I, I did move into that area. I stayed there for five years. I had a brand new, um, I think it was a Mondeo Gear X that sat outside the front. You know, one of the really top quality leather seats and yeah. heated seats and all the rest of it. And then I ended up getting a, a Mercedes A-Class, one of the first ones when they came out, um, which was sat out the front as well. And it was no bother. Everybody implied that there was going to be problems and people were going to target you and, and all the rest. And it's like, no, nah, I got on with everybody. And it's like, you know, and, and I had some of the houses in that area as well. And it was easy for me to maintain it because it was on my doorstep. Hey, mm -hmm. I'll just pop over the now and see you. Just over the road. <laughs> and pop the way back. It's great. It's like, and I didn't, it didn't bother me at all one little bit. Um, and I loved it for that reason. And I always say, it's like, you know, I couldn't care less if I fell in hard times, I'd just move back. But hey, I've still got, I've still got the original house there.
Well, do you know, Jim, that brings us on to what I was going to talk about next. Because obviously you lived in that property and it's now one of your, your buy-to-lets. So yep. let's look at obviously turning your home into I a buy-to-let. I tell you what, though, let's, you're going to talk about this, turning your home into a buy-to-let. Yeah. There's huge advantages of doing that. Let's talk about this then. So what's your thoughts on this? Well, if you're already a homeowner, the, the cheapest way uh, to own your first um, rental property is to turn your own home into a buy-to-let. Um, and if you're re, uh, if you're freelancing or permanently working from home, you could use your freedom to experience new lifestyles and locations um, as a digital nomad. Uh, so fancy swapping the big city for the country life, uh, saying farewell to the mountains or mm -hmm. say hello to the sea. Obviously, we're right next to the beach uh, and even a stint abroad. It's all possible uh, to do with a laptop and Wi-Fi. We've all become so uh, aware how easy it is to work. I mean, Jim, yeah. you and I are sitting in our homes right now. Mm -hmm. um, and we could do a lot of what we do from here. Um, so people are become so aware that they're working remotely as well as, as, as possible now and with the, the technology and things nowadays. So you can work for anywhere. So people yeah. are yeah. intending to move uh, temporarily to places that they've wanted to go for a long time, going abroad and things and renting out their own properties. Um, mm -hmm. But I think there's a, there's a few important points to think of if you're going to do that. And I think firstly is speak to a local agent about how you do that and the best way to do that. Uh, yeah. People like yourselves um, and get an idea of potential rental value and what you need to do in order to actually rent the property. Um, mm -hmm. Just like we've covered a lot of the aspects of obviously um, compliance and costs involved in that as well. Um, and also approach your lender to see if you could simply switch to a buy to let mortgage or you could just get consent to let for maybe a, a, a several years I think usually it's typically it's about two years at a time that they do um, consent to let on any residential mortgage. Some differ though, so you really need to speak to your lender um, yeah. and um, speak to an independent financial advisor and see um, if there's any better deals um, that you can source in order to do that as well. And actually, I'm sure in the beginning, actually, I just kept my normal mortgage on the property and I just transferred it to my, my books as a, as a a, a, a deduction. Um, right, okay. The lender at the time didn't didn't wasn't even bothered or wasn't even couldn't care less. It was it was never a thing about you've got to have a buy to let mortgage. It was like you know just get get permission or or just leave. Yeah, it I think off. it's it's still fairly the same as long as you have consent to let your property. Yeah. And like I say, they do it at certain time scales. Like it's maybe two years at a time. I think. Yeah. Um, as long as you've got that in place, you're fine. There's also advantages. Um, I don't know if it still exists, but I know it's 2020, and I'll put these let and relief uh, uh, criteria this in the link, the let and relief mm -hmm. criteria. But there's advantages to actually being living in the property before and then renting it once you've lived in it. Right, um, okay. And this is called principal uh, private residence relief, and you've got a letting relief. So if you only get partial, if you only get partial relief because you let some of your dwelling houses residential accommodation, you may be entitled to further relief. The further relief is is due where, uh, and this is what it's in the post, you sell a dwelling house which is or has been your only your only main residence, part of what at some time your period of ownership has been let as residential accommodation. Uh, the amount of relief is the lowest of the, the amount of private residence relief I already calculated, 40,000 or the amount of any chargeable gain you may use during letting. During letting. Now, I'm not sure if that's actually changed, but it does say 2020 okay. on it, so you need to check with your accountant. But it, it might have been limited to a bit less now because um, there used to be a um, the last four years used to apply um, uh, as well. You used to have a letting relief in the last four years, but you also used to have the principal private relief as well um, for the period that you lived in it before up to the appreciation on capital gains. So, for example, um, the example of what I was using at the time was if, if I moved in and the house cost me £50,000, by the mm -hmm. time I went to put it to let, it cost £100,000, and I put it to let it for £100,000. But I've no sold it to my seller earning, I still own it. So yeah. the capital gains would, would start on £100,000 as the base the base amount. Right. It wouldn't start on the fifty grand I bought it for because I'd lived in it till that point. I started letting it from the 100000 So that's the letting relief um, that you would get at that point. That's what applied to me. Um, then at the end, you got that four years after, at the very end, you would get a 40000 relief as well which was like, flipping heck, I have no capital gains in this. Now, yeah. I don't, not sure if that exists in its full entirety now, but so check your accountant. But I have put the Inland Revenues publication on here for 2020, where they said 
a bit more about it. Um, but you can do a wee search yourself. But there is real good advantages still, I think, um, if not a bit smaller, um, to actually letting the property you've lived in before. Yeah, no, that's really good. And I think people will find that quite helpful. Um, I meet quite a lot of people um, who are in that situation where they're looking to let the property that they currently live in. Um, so, yeah, that's quite it good. Was, but always, it, was always the, it was all the rage, remember, when the credit crunch was on. Yeah. People couldn't, people needed to sell their house. They couldn't sell their house because nobody was buying. And it was because of their circumstances. Either they need to upgrade because they have a bigger family. Baby's not going to wait nine months or more. <laughs> that's yeah. it. We're coming, whether you like it or no. Um, and and you, some of them had to downsize because they couldn't manage the stairs and they had nowhere else, so they had no choice. So what we were doing is we were putting them on to buy to let mortgages and yeah. allowing them to release all the money they'd built up over the years and then go and put in a deposit on their next house and then they kept that as a buy to let, which is why a lot of we call reluctant landlords at that time built up and the reluctant landlords then began to sell almost now. The begin, you know, that's that's where that's why in the last five years the number of rental properties in Fife have actually dropped by one thousand two hundred. Yeah. So there's actually less rental properties in Fife than there was five years ago. Mm -hmm. So stick that in your pipe and smoke it. All these people that say all these landlords are taking properties because <laughs> <laughs> they're not. We've got less now than we have five years ago. And yeah. there's more owner occupiers. There's over about nine thousand people more than five years ago are owner occupiers now at properties mm -hmm. in Fife. So again, there's more people actually owning their own home in Fife than there was five years ago. So again, that's another great statistic. I base my fact, I base my my knowledge on facts rather than just what everybody else's opinion is. Yeah, I mean it's quite um it's quite a tricky thing because there's a lot of people out there who have got an opinion, but it's not always based on factual information. And well, people pick up on that. Right, right. Opinions. <laughs> the problem well, with well, opinions, well, everybody well, has well. them, even idiots. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, yeah, I mean, obviously, always draw from the facts and never just listen to other people's opinion or hearsay, yeah. especially when it comes to things like, obviously, investment and, and things that are going to have an effect on, on you. But uh, yeah, I mean, with your own home, always decide if you want to include furnishings or, or how you're going to store them or yeah, yeah. Or, or things or, or maybe sell them on. I mean, typically we say do an unfurnished property. Um, that might I'm not always be the case, but that's generally the best option to go with. Well, uh, remember you that want, you would want an unfurnished property, wouldn't you, Richard? Because more people are bring their furniture more than likely. Um, they also become less transient because yeah. it's not easier for them to move because they've got all their furniture to move at the same time as well. So therefore, you tend to attract a longer term tenant if they're bringing their own furniture because they can't be bored with the hassle. It's just yeah. not that aggravating enough for somebody to move because all the hassle involved in having to move. Um, so they often stay a lot longer than actually people in furnished properties, which generally just, let's just call them serviced accommodation now, really. That's what, yeah. that's what furnished properties are. People who are generally looking to let on the longer term have their other own things anyway. Yeah, uh, and want to come and make it a home. So let them do that and give them the space to do that. I um, always remember that buy to let mortgages come with a, a lower loan to value ratio and generally top out at maybe about 80%. Mm -hmm. They're also mostly based on the monthly rental income being at least 125% of the mortgage payments. The mortgage payments. Some, some lenders are actually 140% of the mortgage payments. So that's on what saying. type yeah. of lending you get. I think so, the 80% is 140 75 or less is 125% because they, they want that degree of comfort um, that there's more coverage in the mortgage um, with the rent because it's a higher a higher rate of mortgage. Uh, and that's our criteria. Um, again, check with your local mortgage broker. Um, yeah. we, we've got really, we've got yeah. really two good ones, haven't we? Yeah. And always, always speak to a local agent and get a uh, a dependable and, and, a, and a, a, a realistic rental value for the property because that's obviously going to your lender's going to want to know that and it needs to be it needs to be a realistic rental value for the area and the, it has and the market to be, at the time. We, we had this recently didn't we in Ely where yep. somebody's gone and gone real overboard and one of the letting agents said how much more than what you said sorry what did they say how much more than what you said what about oh there were it was hundreds and I actually had one yesterday and it was Anstruther, and you don't know about this yet, Jim, yeah. and it was crazy. And the guy was trying to push the rental value up 
for the purpose he's lender and I'm like well no I can't I can't just make it up <laughs> to suit your letter I mean people who are not thinking about the actual current market and, and don't know the area and don't have the knowledge and how property will move um, and it was just pie in the sky numbers like this is, hundreds this of this is the obsession for people trying to keep the existing property they've got when they don't realize the numbers don't make sense mm -hmm. there's no tolerance in there that's why yeah. the lender's saying that your rent that you're getting the coverage won't be able to cover the mortgage enough and the way you're trying to do this is basically to to for want a better word mislead mislead the company the mortgage company but it's going to come back to haunt you it's there yeah. for a reason and the numbers don't stack up so for god's sake sell the asset if that's the case yeah. If, if, if you're going to, you know, stick to the existing rent and stick to the existing criteria, but don't try and release money on something that's going to come back to haunt you, because yeah. it will. And then what's going to happen is you release that money in this scenario, the market maybe does take a dip, and then you kind of get rid of the house, but then you have to sell the house for less than what you thought it was in the first place. Therefore, yeah. you're in a worse position because you yeah. possibly can't even pay back the mortgage. You're stuck. You're in a you're in an equity trap. You're in a debt trap. And it's like yeah. you don't realize that's coming, and that's what you have to be aware of um, in these scenarios. It, I, I only know that because it happened to me in the credit crunch with some of my portfolio. I was lucky enough to have a big enough portfolio that offset it quite easily, and now it's all recovered. I don't need to worry about that anymore. Um, and I'm now beginning, I'm now going to go, okay, I'm going to pay off three of them right now. So I'm about to do that as well. So it's I've now gone full circle and I'm able to mitigate that. But I didn't do the I didn't go down these routes and I didn't take these options. I didn't take that risk because I felt that was completely unnecessary. And and that's that's probably why I'm still here and others aren't. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know yourself. We've got one, two, three. I know three landlords of top of top my my, my yes, head. Yeah. I have about twelve. 45, 45, and the other one, 45. Um, probably about 50 properties between them that are like that situation. Yeah. Uh, and that's that. And, and for me, that I mean, you know, I'm, I'm not like that situation at all, and I've got the same amount because I did it properly. Mm -hmm. uh, I made sure I, I, I made sure that I had some, some sort of relationship. I knew exactly what was happening. I covered all the bases, and I, and I made sure I extrapolated that to the right, to the right amount. So I could forecast, so I I, I de-risk the situation. Um, so I, I foresee that. This is only because of my training in industry, where I was in manufacturing. It was always Willie McCall used to bump me, drum it into me. Willie said, always de-risk the downside. Always look at that. And Richard Branson talks about it as well. As long as you mitigate the downside, then you've got no risk involved. And that could mean in underwriting or insuring something. In order to stop that, you know, any risk it could harm. The classic example is a company day out. That was one of the ones that I was told about. Company day out, somebody hurts themselves on the company day out, therefore you get sued, therefore you're over the barrel. So I was told to go and get insurance as a company secretary to make yeah. sure that's covered in that instance. And it's like, oh, I never thought of that. I never even thought of things like that. So it's all that experience that we've got here in house because of everything I learned in industry and as a company secretary for, for many major uh, manufacturing companies uh, previously. So yeah. what's the last one here? You can, the last you can, one is uh, buying an existing limited company. Um, yeah, so easy. One, yeah, one, yeah, one of the main obstacles for landlords is starting or expanding their portfolio um, at the level of, uh, and, and as the level of purchase tax. So as well as the standard stamp duty or LBTT or whatever we call it, landlords pay a second home supplement that adds an extra 3% England, 4% Scotland, yeah, yeah. Uh, to the purchase price, uh, which is a significant upfront sum. Um, however, things change dramatically when you buy a through a limited company that, that owns investment property among its assets. Uh, so stamp duty on the shares is just 0.5% with no second home tax. So yeah, yeah, further yeah. ongoing benefits uh, for owning and rental properties, it's owning rental properties through a limited companies. So Jim, you want to go run through a couple of them? Well, you're paying your corporation tax profits at the, at the corporation tax rate. It's currently 19%. 19, yeah. Even if you're a higher rate taxpayer, this is one I spoke about. So yep. I remember in the beginning, we started Parker Housing Limited because we had got to the point where I was beginning to be a higher rate taxpayer at working in industry. And mm -hmm. Elaine had bought so many in her own name that she was beginning to be a higher rate taxpayer as well. So we thought, we'll just start a limited company and leave it in there. Now, obviously, if you take money out in dividends, that'll be taxable. But you can actually leave it there 
and just for a rainy day for when you actually need it or reinvest it. Yeah. So that's the sort of thing um, you would want to do. So it's a great advantage to have a limited company in that way, especially if you're a high-rate taxpayer. So if you're earning quite a lot of money, limited company is the way to go. Yeah, uh, you, 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 I mean, being able to claim the entire month of mortgage payment is a allowable taxable expense. The the I I think it's uh, I R twenty two or twenty or something like that okay. is the mortgage interest deduction at lower rate only. Um, you're allowed for um, it's sole traders for people in their own right investing in property uh, property investment. Um, well, it's not applicable to a company, so therefore the whole mortgage is deductible against the whole rental income. There's no there's no difference in that. It's the same as what it was before, whereas it's changed for uh, sole traders and individuals. Um, there's no capital gains tax liability when you sell if you keep the profits in the company for improving and expanding the portfolio as well. So there's, you know, it's huge amount of advantages there uh, in that. Um, so there's a big, big advantage to doing that. Um, it's all taxable at that corporation tax rate. Uh, and, and, and that's why you want to use a limited company. Now, while finance for limited companies isn't widely available as it is for regular buy-to-let mortgages, more and more high street lenders' names are offering products alongside specialist lenders. You could speak to a mortgage broker about this, and we could easily refer you to someone. Typical examples are the Birmingham Midshires. Um, you've got the Mortgage Works, which is owned by the Nationwide. Um, you've got other organisations like All the More. You've got um, and all these different lenders that do buy to let for limited companies. Um, but most of these lenders now require you to go through a, a mortgage broker. Now, the reason they want you to go through a mortgage broker is because they're saving the costs of having to employ somebody all the time to actually do this for them. Mm -hmm. um, so they often give better deals, more advan advantageous deals on mortgages to the mortgage brokers than they do to their own people because they yeah. want to push everybody onto mortgage brokers because then their business becomes, you know, the only pay for somebody actually being successful at what they do. That's why they're wanting to do it. Because then if they've not got anybody, in times where mortgages drop, for example, the credit crunch, they wouldn't yep. have all these people employed. They would just have mortgage broker, and they're all self-employed, and they're all doing deals, and they're all getting paid when they get a successful deal. So you get paid by results, and they make money by results then. That's why they want to give better mortgage products and better advantages to people that are self-employed mortgage advisors. So that's why Kessa Talimi, Neil Bird, these are the two I could tell yeah. off the top of my head. Brilliant at what they do. Uh, Kessler's an active investor, so he's bigger portfolio landlords. Um, Neil's easy to do one or two buy to let mortgages, but when we get to bigger, we say Kessler is the person yeah. to go to. Um, and he's an active landlord, so he gets it straight away. Uh, and invest. Yeah. Kessler's got a really good knowledge of, obviously, like you say, he's in the field, he does it for himself, um, and, he, and he's also got experience in bridging and things as well. Yeah, it's the same as what I've done here. People will come to us because of the knowledge and expertise I've built up over the years, but the knowledge and expertise that you've learned being in the lens business for over 10, 12 years now, 12 um, and the knowledge you've learned from me as well. So that's why people come to us, because of the expertise. They don't come to us to let a property, they come to us for peace of mind. Yeah, I was just going to say, because it allows people not to have to worry about all the things that we do as an, on a daily basis. Absolutely, absolutely. I would say so. Um, Okay, yeah. so final words on this. What well, I mean, my final words on there's, I was, ugh, there's nothing, you know. I mean, th this is this is the, let's be right. I'm going to say it. This is the best asset class you can ever invest in. Yeah, it is literally a vehicle that goes up in value in the medium to long term, and it pays you to wait while it goes up in value. What other asset class does that? Crypto does not do that. It's on its knees. No, it's nobody saying anything about crypto. I dare you to say anything about crypto, anybody out there, because we'll laugh at you. Uh, gold doesn't do that, because it doesn't pay you while it goes up or down in value. Uh, silver doesn't do that. Um, platinum and all these precious things don't do that. Even things like commodities, like oil and stuff like that, that that's all just that's all just based on the principle that somebody's going to pay more than what you 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 bought it for. There's yeah. nothing getting manufactured or provided there as a service, um, and that's what I love about it. Property does that every single time. And somebody argued with me, well, the stock market does that. And it's like, aye, the stock market has given an annual return, the FTSE 100, over the last 20 years, every single year, of 4.5%. Okay, 
compare that with property, which is potentially 15 to 20 percent. Yeah. That's the income and the capital appreciation over the years. When you say it like that, it's a no-brainer. But I mean, if if you're if you're obviously venturing into property um, and want to do buy to let investment and things, there are ways, yeah. like we've discussed this morning, to really slash your costs and be smart and do things and think about things smartly to yeah. Yeah. avoid obviously these extra costs. Uh, whether it be tax or whether it's purch uh, when you're purchasing if it's stamp duty or setting home tax and things that's like that. and that's us for this morning thanks so much for all your insights jim as usual and uh, thanks everybody for watching anything you want to ask stick it in the comments we on the rerun and we will come back to you or message us direct bye-bye for now folks